Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host for this, I think, very informative series of programs we'll be presenting. I want to uh, take this time to uh, welcome you to Pilgrim Publications Presents. On this program, I'm uh, generally a co-host, and this particular show is no exception, as uh, my other co-host for this program is here on, in the studio with me today. And I'd like to go ahead and introduce him right now. If our camera can turn to Bob L. Ross. Bob L. Ross is director of Pilgrim Publications. He's written many books. One of the leading publishers of Spurgeon's works, Charles Haddon Spurgeon's works uh, in the world, I suppose. Bob, you have anything to say there? Larry, we're happy to be on television for this program today concerning the doctrine of the Trinity one of the most fundamental and uh, historical doctrines that Christianity has held down through the years, one of the uh, controversial doctrines, but uh, nevertheless it is one of the foundational teachings of perhaps all the conservative evangelical churches that represent Christianity. And uh, it's a big subject and we don't expect to exhaust it or to answer everything concerning it, but uh, we do count it a privilege and a blessing to be here to affirm it and to take our stance for the doctrine of the Trinity in its historical context as it's been asserted by the churches and theologians and confessions down through the years. Well said, Bob. Uh with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our other guest for this program in this special series. Uh, Bob, in fact, uh, you would probably be more qualified to introduce our, our guest than myself. Uh, I would like to say we have Mark McNeil here, but I'll let you give his other credits. Well, we have Mark with us uh, for the additional reason, not only for his uh, knowledge of this particular subject, but his uh, background. Mark has been in the past, as we have had him on this program before, uh, involved in uh, not only a non-Trinitarian group, but actually we might call it an anti-Trinitarian group because I think the predominant emphasis of the particular group that he was with is anti-Trinitarian, not merely non-Trinitarian. And uh, Mark was the 1990 valedictorian uh, of a Bible college in Houston, Texas that's identified with this particular oneness or anti-Trinitarian uh, denomination. And uh, so that plus the fact that he has given a great deal of study to the Trinity and uh, by virtue of his leaving his identity with this group perhaps shows the uh, weight of the evidence, at least as he has judged it, to be on the side of the Trinitarian position. Many of us are not really confronted with the problem of deciding. It's kind of like we're brought up in it and, and we're so accustomed to it that we never had a reason to say, uh, doubt it or test it or uh, make a choice. And uh, so we're glad to have Mark with us once again, and uh, he'll be contributing to our discussion here. You know, it's great to have Mark here. Uh, as a matter of fact, for our viewing audience, uh, in case you're interested through uh, our ministry, I'm also associated with the Research and Education Foundation and uh, a videotape available through Pilgrim Publications or the Research and Education Foundation called Analysis of the United Pentecostal Church, of which Mark was a member, and he is also a star on this videotape. In case uh, you're watching this and would like uh, further information, this video will be of a tremendous help in uh, analyzing that particular re religious group and their concepts of uh, the oneness of God versus the, the Trinity, the Trinitarian view. Uh, as long as I'm talking about videos, I might as well mention there's another video available also uh, also here uh, called the uh, debate with leaders of the United Pentecostal Church. This is a debate that features some 
Christians from the historic Trinitarian point of view debating some of the leaders of the UPC, uh, David Bernard and J.L. Hall. Well, uh, I did want to let Mark say a few words. Mark, uh, me and Bob have been talking all around you, but uh, would you like to have any introductory statements you'd like to make regarding your uh, exodus, maybe from the UPC and uh, this whole idea of how important is the Trinity? What Does it really matter? Well, I think we'll find as we proceed in this uh, series of shows today that uh, uh, I've grown to appreciate and love the doctrine of the Trinity more and more as that time has gone on. It has become uh, less and less a matter of argumentation and more and more a practical matter of devotion and love for God and appreciation for what he has chosen to reveal us about himself. But uh, I think we'll see that uh, my conviction is that the doctrine of the Trinity is so intricately interwoven into the fabric of Scripture that to deny any part of it is really an attack upon the basics of the Christian faith. If you remove the Father, you remove the Son, or you remove the Holy Spirit, uh, then you are uh, affecting the message in a negative way. And so uh, it is our job, I think, as uh, Christians and people who love the Lord and people who love the Scriptures to be as accurate as we can in our conception of God. And that's, I think, what our task is today, is to do our best to have a full and complete and proper understanding of the God that we serve. And uh, Very well said. Uh, I would like to get us into this uh, series of programs where we'll be analyzing, discussing uh, from the biblical base, the historical base of this whole concept of the doctrine of the Trinity. After all, this is a doctrine that uh, is widely attacked. Mark here can testify, having been in the United Pentecostal Church, uh, which uh, I think majors, perhaps, on attacking the Trinity in their own enunciation of uh, this oneness doctrine that uh, goes against it. I guess in church history it would be called uh, monarchianistic modalism or Sabellianism or something along that line. You know. So uh, with that said, we want to start getting into it uh, in a uh, more intricate way. And uh, to lead us into that, I'd like to have Mark uh, get into this whole concept of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, what it means. I, I know you brought some charts with you. Perhaps you'd mm -hmm. like to uh, uh, lead into your discussion with some of the charts you have, and uh, and uh, we'll just go from there, and the three of us will discuss these, these issues together. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd like to do, if we can look at the first chart. Okay. Um, what I did, I'd like to just run through this instead of dwelling on each point. Uh, in a, to a great degree, but to show just basically the basis and the origin of Trinitarian thought. And there's quite a bit of uh, controversy about this because in history, and we'll be talking about history too, I'm sure, later on, but uh, in history we see uh, you can find marked doctrines that attack one or more points of the doctrine of the Trinity, and that required that there be formulations of each point and strong statements with regard to each part of the doctrine of the Trinity. But what I want to show in this chart is that uh, the basics of the doctrine, the fundamental idea of the doctrine of the Trinity is, uh, as I stated a few moments ago, inherent to the revelation of Scripture. And uh, so we can just run through these points. Here I say the formal doctrine of the Trinity resulted from the experience of Christians from the very start. It was only when it was attacked that uh, the formal statements had to be made. For instance, the scriptures speak of God as our Father. So to deny the fatherhood of God is uh, something that would fly in the face of the scriptural re revelation. And I just listed a couple of things here that the scriptures identify about the Father, some actions of the Father, something about the Father in scripture. For instance, we're reconciled to him. The, the message of the New Testament particularly and of the message of the Bible as a whole is that we are alienated from God and, and we stand in need of being reconciled to God. And so it is particularly in relationship to the Father that we are reconciled. And then I secondly mentioned that Christ speak, uh, frequently spoke of the Father as his sender and he as his messenger. And uh, I didn't list any scriptures because to simply open the Bible you'll find constant references where Christ would speak of himself as the one sent from the Father or as he has received of the Father so he shows unto us and all types of statements like that. So uh, these are just things that are uh, plainly obvious on every page of scripture practically. And then secondly the scriptures speak of the Son of the Father. 
And this is also something that uh, simply cannot be denied. Uh, and these are a couple of things with regard to the Son that I simply wanted to mention. Number one, the Son reconciles us to the Father through His sufferings. Number two, the Son is our high priest and He shares in our sufferings. And the Son is both a man and object of worship. And these are uh, things that we could dwell on to a great extent as well. But the simple point I want to make is that uh, to simply understand the scriptural doctrine or to understand the scriptural teaching, you will have to acknowledge God as our Father, and you'll also see Christ as being the Son of the Father. Now, if we can go to the next one, we'll kind of wrap up that particular idea. And then finally, the scriptures speak of the Holy Spirit. And these are a couple of things that the scriptures speak about the Holy Spirit particularly doing, such as the Spirit regenerates our hearts and illuminates our minds. And then number two, the Spirit convicts and intercedes on our behalf. And Romans 8 would be a passage here, and Titus 3, 5 would be one there. And then so my conclusion on the basis of these several points that we've brought out is that there's a threefold operation and relationship with God that is implicit, inherent, and essential to the New Testament revelation of God and salvation. It was this experience which led to the de detailed development of Trinitarian thought. Now, this is extremely important, I think, at this point, because there are a lot of anti-Trinitarian groups which we're not wanting to major at this moment on their particular arguments, but one of their primary arguments is that the doctrine of the Trinity developed and that it was not initially there. It is our conviction and belief that the doctrine of the Trinity is an essential part of the scriptural revelation of God, and uh, as such, it cannot be denied, and it was always there. But its uh, detailed formulations to where they excluded all other doctrines, they took place in time as this essential doctrine was attacked. And that's the key point I want to make here, is that the doctrine of the Trinity is essential and uh, inbuilt into the very revelation of God in Scripture and the experience of the Christian. As a Christian, I know that I need to be reconciled to God, my Father, or our Father, and I also need to, be, I, uh, need to be drawn to the Father through the work of His Holy Spirit. And then uh, the work of the Holy Spirit drawing me to the Father is only made possible through the saving work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, uh, suffering for us to make it uh, a reality that we come to the Father. So those are the few points I wanted to make here. And um, if you want to go to the next chart, uh, what I've done here, now if you want to stop at any point, just let me know. But what I've done here is I've introduced what we mean by the doctrine of the Trinity and gone into a more detailed uh, scriptural proof of each point of that doctrine. You want me to continue yes, doing that? Yes, it'll be fine. Okay. I've simply uh, defined the doctrine of the Trinity as within the nature of the one true God, there are three distinctions that are personal in nature. Uh, now, for some, that may be kind of vague in your mind. So what I've done is I have proven each point of this doctrine, I think, through uh, scriptural references. Number one, that there is one God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Galatians 3, 20 states, God is one. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is but one God. And these are just uh, samples of the multitude of scriptures that we could use, as well as uh, implications of these truths that are scattered throughout the Bible. And so we recognize as Trinitarians that there is only one God. Those who attack the Trinitarian faith and claim that it is a, a tritheistic or a polytheistic faith are denying the very fundamental truth on which the doctrine of the Trinity is built. And you can turn to any uh, theology book or doctrine book on the Trinity, and you'll find that one of the very first chapters almost always will be a, a, an, an exposition and a stress on the fact that there is only one God and there can be only one God. But this biblical revelation goes on and shows us more. Now, uh, let me say, by the way, that there are an abundant amount of things that we can talk about when we talk about God. In this particular series of shows, we're talking specifically about the Trinitarian distinctions within God. But this is not what we should confine the doctrine of God to, but that's what we're majoring here on. Uh, the, do the idea of distinctions within the nature of God that we've stated as part of our definition. I've simply defined it here. I opened up a, a standard uh, dictionary and looked for a definition of distinction, which is a differentiation, the act of distinguishing a difference. So if, I can, uh, if I'm affirming a distinction, that means I'm uh, identifying something that differentiates or distinguishes between one or more objects or ideas or something. Now, here's the next point. In the New Testament, there are distinguishing actions between three who are affirmed to be God. That's a very important point, and I've simply 
uh, given several references for proving each one of those points. The Father is affirmed to be God, and there are not any groups, to my knowledge, that believe the Scriptures that deny that point. It's the next two that we have some problems with in some different groups. The Son is God, and I've listed Hebrews 1.8, where the Scripture says, Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. We could mention John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was God, or... Um, Perhaps uh, John 20:28, 20, where Thomas said, "My Lord and my God," or Romans 9:5, or Titus 2:13, or various other passages of Scripture, and then the Holy Spirit is God as well. Uh, scripture calls the Holy Spirit God in Acts 5, 3 to 5, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And then it goes back and says, You have lied to the Holy Spirit, where the terms Holy Spirit and God are used interchangeably, denoting that the Spirit is God. And then I make this point: not only are each called God but the attributes of deity are ascribed to each. Now, this solidifies the fact that they are called God. They're not only called God in some secondary sense, but each one, uh, the Scriptures affirm that they have the attributes of deity, such as omnipresence, omniscience, self-sufficiency, uh, that they are in immutable, such as the Son in, remember, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever that he's immutable or unchangeable. Uh, Christ saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, which would denote his omnipresence. And, of course, the Holy Spirit is said to be omnipresent in uh, Psalm 139, 7 to 10. And also the Holy Spirit is called eternal in Hebrews 9, 14, and God alone is eternal. So all of these things indicate that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God. And then the next point, and this is where we get into the unique area of Trinitarian thought. Once we've established that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are God, next we are to demonstrate the distinctions that are real there. First off, the Father alone sins. You'll never find that reversed in Scripture. The Father sends the Son. The Father sends the Holy Spirit. Secondly, the Son is sent by the Father. Never the other way around. Now, that's very important because some actions in Scripture are distinguished between and then they tend to be blurred, such as uh, the Scripture teaches that the Father raised up Christ from the dead. In another passage, Christ will say, I will raise myself from the dead. And another passage refers to Christ being raised by the Spirit. Uh, that is true with regard to some actions, but there are other actions that are never blurred and never distinguished between, and this is one of them. The Son is always sent by the Father and never the other way around. You don't have confusion with regard to the distinguishment between them. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son and never is the sender. The Holy Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son according to these particular passages of Scripture that we have given you there uh, that you can look up, which affirm each one of these points. Now, the next chart uh, makes the point that I just made. These distinctions are never confused, changed, or reversed. And then this threefold distinction of the one God is not only in relationship to us or creation, but is internal. Now, this is also an important point because uh, there are some people that say, yes, we acknowledge distinctions, but not distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're just distinctions from our perspective. Uh, or they try to describe the distinctions between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as distinctions like we experience, such as I may be a father or a son or a husband and all of these roles, but yet I'm the same person. Uh, what I've shown here in this diagram, this illustration that I've used here, is that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit interacting between each other. And the Scripture describes this in various terms, and I've just chosen a few of them that are apparent throughout the Scripture. For instance, and these lines show the interrelationship between them. For instance, the Father loves the Son, the Father knows the Son, the Father sends the Son, He speaks to the Son, He bears witness of the Son, according to these various passages of Scripture. And then the Son, likewise, speaks to, is sent, and knows the Father. This shows reciprocal action or communication or action toward each other. Uh, and then the Father, for instance, sends and speaks to the Holy Spirit according to these passages of Scripture. Or the Holy Spirit intercedes to or sent by and knows and hears from the Father. And all these various things. And you can see how they interrelate with each other. And the Scripture does not leave out any one of these points. It shows that this interaction goes on between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This prohibits us from developing some type of a theory that would do away with these as being real distinctions. So... Uh, you can go to the next chart if you would. Um, uh, so summarizing what we've already covered, we've shown that there's one God, 
And we've shown that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is each God. And we've also shown that there are distinctions that are made between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So whatever doctrine of God that we have, it must accommodate all of these facts that are apparent throughout the Scripture. And that's what I want to make very clear, is that uh, Trinitarians are simply taking the evidence of Scripture and they're wanting to hold to each point entirely. They're not wanting to leave out any point. And I think we can go through each one of the alternate theories that are offered in the place of the doctrine of the Trinity, and I think we can show how they violate one or more of the points that we've already brought forth. They either deny the deity of Christ, the deity of the Holy Spirit, uh, they deny that there's one God, or they deny the distinctions of the one God. Now, uh, with this chart, which is my final chart here, uh, I show a final clinching point to me, and that is that the doctrine of the Trinity or the idea of the Trinity in Scripture is not only presented as a temporal thing, which in uh, theological terms some people have called it the economic Trinity as opposed to the uh, inherent Trinity or imminent Trinity. Uh, here I want to demonstrate in these several points that what we're talking about when we distinguish between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not just time-centered things. They are eternal and real in the nature of God. First off, the first point I would like to bring up is that the nature of God is immutable. Therefore, whatever God reveals about Himself is true eternally, if it's true with regard to the nature of God, or else you have God changing, which is an impossibility. Malachi 3.6 is one of many references, uh, which says, I, the Lord, change not. Uh, and we could also use uh, James 1, I think, verse 17 or 18, where it says that uh, every good gift and perfect gift cometh from above and from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of changing so, or turning. So God does not change. Secondly, if God's revelation in Scripture does not reveal God as He is essentially, then we are left with no real knowledge of God. So, in other words, if God shows us something about Himself in time, but yet that's not true with regard to God in eternity, then what assurance do we have that our knowledge of God is true and accurate and real? How do we know that it's not all just a facade? Well, as Christians, we believe that God in the Bible has revealed as He is truly and in reality. And so we are compelled to believe that these Trinitarian distinctions that are inherent in, in the Scriptures themselves, we are compelled to believe that they are real and that they are eternal, eternally true. And then the last point that I'll bring up with regard to that is that the Bible affirms not only are we left to these points, uh, which arise from the attributes of God and the nature of God's revelation, but the Scripture also reveals by various statements of truth that this relationship is, in fact, eternal. Uh, such as John 17, 5, Christ speaks of the glory that He enjoyed with the Father before the worlds were made. Uh, Jesus said, And now, Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self with the glory that I had with Thee before the world was. So that affirms this distinction before the creation of the world. Of course, Hebrews 9.14 speaks of the eternal spirit if one would be compelled to say that the spirit is not equally eternal. And then so, and then I also bring forth this point, uh, which uh, kind of falls back on a basic hermeneutical principle, and that is that Old Testament passages become understandable in the light of the New Testament revelation. In other words, as I open the Bible and I read through the Old Testament and I see, for instance, Genesis 1.26 where God said, let us make man in our image. Uh, some uh, have uh, developed various different theories of interpreting that and various different ways of explaining that. Uh, my position is, and I think as Trinitarians our position is, that we await the future revelation of God to further illumine our minds with regard to this idea that's presented in Genesis 1.26, which I've just used as an example of that. We could refer to many things, such as Isaiah 48.16 and uh, the, the Hebrew word Elohim, the plural word for God, and various things like that. In the light of the New Testament revelation, this becomes understandable. For instance, let me just illustrate this, and then I'll be completed here. Uh, take Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. And then turn to John 14, I think it's verse 23, where Jesus said, uh, My Father, we will come unto Him, me and my Father, we will come unto Him and make our abode with Him. We're clearly the subjects of the Father and the Son. Almost the identical same uh, words are used, us and our, are used in John 14. Now, as Christians, we believe that God's revelation is uh, harmonious and everything complements each other, and that throughout history God has been unfolding His revelation of Himself. 
And in light of this principle, we can go back and see God unfolding the revelation of the triune God in implications such as Genesis 126 that are specifically affirmed and revealed in the New Testament revelation. And so that's just an important point that I wanted to bring up that also involves some very important principles of biblical interpretation. So those are just a few uh, uh, introductory points with regard to the Trinity, that uh, there's one God who has revealed himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that these are distinct in a very real way, and they act personally toward each other, but yet they are still the one true and living God outside of whom there can be and will never be another God. And so those are just the basic introductory points. Well, Mark, that was a very excellent, strong exposition of the Scripture uh, defining the doctrine of the Trinity. I just have a point of curiosity I want to ask you about. Uh, I could hear the conviction in your voice on, the, on these things. Having come from uh, a United Pentecostal background, denying the Trinity as you did, I was curious as to uh, what started to get you moving away from that doctrine of the oneness to the scriptural uh, reality of the Trinity. What, what started make, putting doubts in your mind that maybe the UPC was wrong on this oneness, this monarchianistic modalism? Well, to be very honest with you, it was several things. But right on this chart right here, we have one of the verses that I never could come up with a satisfactory explanation for it in my own mind, where Jesus said that he had glory with the Father before the worlds were made. Now, I had explanations of all the passages that, that I have used here or that could be used by a Trinitarian. I had explanations of them. But what I started coming to realize is that uh, uh, as, as a person who believes the Bible, it is not uh, advantageous just to be able to explain passages of Scripture. But as a Christian believing the Bible to be God's revelation, it is most advantageous to believe the Bible as it naturally should be understood. In other words, I'd pick up the Bible and I would see all these things, and instead of uh, trying to come up with explanations to explain away their obvious sense, uh, I felt like it would be more appropriate for me to simply humble myself and approach the scriptural revelation and accept what God has revealed, even though I may not understand all about it. So it's things like John 17, 5 that really sparked my thinking. And then I entered into their Bible college with questions like this. This is Texas Bible Texas college. Bible College. I entered into the Bible college with questions like this, and I posed these questions to many of my instructors. And many of my questions were left unanswered. For instance, I can tell you about one encounter uh, quickly. In our Greek class, uh, when we took Greek, which was my senior year, uh, the professor uh, in the Greek class was dealing with John 1.1. And he said, the scripture says the word was with God. And he said the Greek preposition here is pros, which uh, he said this word uh, does not necessarily denote a distinction in the Trinitarian sense. And he said if the, the writer, John, was wanting to indicate the doctrine of the Trinity or the Trinitarian idea, he would have used the Greek word para instead. Well, immediately this came to mind that this very passage of scripture right here uses the word para for with as opposed to pros. Uh -huh. And so instead of quibbling over John 1.1, 1, 1, I brought that to his attention. I said, uh, Brother, uh, John 17.5 uses the very word you said would indicate the doctrine of the Trinity. And he said, Are you certain? And he opened his Greek New Testament to John 17.5, and he found that word there. And he said, Huh. And he just sat back and never provided an answer for me. And I could tell you endless stories of that nature, as well as when I left the school, I presented... Uh, some basic summarized questions against their doctrines and uh, for the doctrine of the Trinity, to which none of them ever replied. And to this date, only one United Pentecostal minister that had nothing to do with my uh, education has even responded to any of the questions that I posed. So it was things like that, the reading the Scriptures, wanting to be honest with the Word of God, that I found out I'm explaining away too much here. There's, there's, there's something there that I'm not incorporating into my thinking. And so I became honest with it, and I started posing these questions to these people that were instructing me, and, uh, and it came about in that way. And I started studying after Trinitarian writers, and I started finding out that much of what I was taught was distorted, and that it was not a real picture of Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, I found out that I had quite a distorted view of what they were actually saying. Now, I want to point something out right here, Mark, just briefly for our audience. Uh, I want to recommend some books just real quick here, because obviously in a television show like this, 
we're not going to be able to get into everything in all the details. So the doctrine of Trinity is a very heavyweight subject that requires a lot of study and diligence to, uh, to search out the scriptures to find out more about it. Uh, here's just some books I, I would recommend uh, for you to get a hold of at your Christian bookstore or uh, contact Pilgrim Bookstore. I'm sure you all... That book's out of here. print. This book's out of print here? Yes, it is. Carl yes. Brumbach. Back. Brumbach. Uh, God and Three Persons. Well, uh, I didn't know it was out of print until Mark just mentioned it, but uh, I'm sure there could be Xerox copies made of this or something for people that would be interested in this. Uh, also, a book I, I like a lot called God and uh, Three Persons by Calvin Weissner. Uh, what I like the most about this is he really gets into the historical background of the doctrine of the Trinity. Many groups deny that the, the Trinity doctrine goes all the way back to the first century. They're always saying it started at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., and so forth, but Carl gets into some, I mean, uh, Calvin gets into some great uh, historical evidences here in this particular book. This other book is also excellent, called The Trinity by Edward Henry Bickerstaff, and uh, I don't think this book's out of print, though, is it? No. And uh, this gets into a lot of the biblical doctrines, uh, the, the scriptures you need to look up and, and find out in your own personal studies. One other thing I'd like to recommend, make sure we get it on the tape, is uh, the Christian Research Institute has an excellent little outline by Robert M. Bowman, Jr. And uh, it's called The Biblical Analysis of the Doctrine of the Trinity. And this thing is just filled with hundreds and hundreds of references dealing with the Trinity from every perspective you could think of. He's also written an excellent book, uh, I think put out by uh, Baker Bookhouse, called uh, Why You Should Believe the Trinity in response to... Uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness publication that would attack it. Now, I just want to get those in for our viewers' sake to let them know that uh, this little show we're putting on is not all there is. There's plenty of good books and theology books out there that you can obtain through your local Christian bookstore or your local library. Now, uh, to get back to Mark here for a second, we're going to get Bob in here <laughs> in a moment, uh, Mark, but uh, you, uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about how you were at this United Pentecostal College and we talked about this oneness thing, but I don't think we, at this point in the show, we've ever enunciated for our viewers, what is this monarchianistic modalism? What, what do they exactly believe in contrast to Trinitarian beliefs? Well, the uh, uh, doctrine of oneness, as uh, it is commonly called, or modalistic monarchianism, as it's historically called, is an attempt to answer all of this evidence that we brought forth or observations from Scripture by denying that the distinctions are real between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And instead of saying that they are real, they say that they are temporary and they are simply modes of manifesting the one person of God. So what they actually do is they deny the, uh, the real distinctions of the Trinity and instead they say that uh, there's one God, one person of God, who is manifest in Jesus Christ, incarnate in Christ. And, uh, and he is the one person of God, and there are no real distinctions other than that. Now, it gets into, when they start trying to answer the things that we've brought up, it gets into some other aspects of their doctrine, such as the, the heart of their uh, argument is based on the dual nature of Christ as they understand it. Uh, Christ was both God and man, and they say that this distinction between deity and humanity uh, accounts for all of these things we've been bringing up that distinguish between the Father and the Son. But to quickly answer that, I would refer back to, say, John 17:5 or John 1, 1, which affirms the distinction before the Incarnation. And so we can quickly do away with uh, that doctrine, as well as observing the fact that if the uh, monistic doctrine were correct, then what we actually have in Scripture is a facade, because what we actually have is Christ uh, communicating with, uh, acting upon, uh, having reciprocal communication with the Father and the Son as well as the Holy Spirit when actually this is not real. So uh, we are left with a lot of scriptures to explain away. We are left with a, in my opinion, a distorted doctrine of the person of Christ which makes him actually two persons rather than uh, the union of deity and humanity in a single person. Uh, which we can discuss that, I guess, under the historical development of doctrine. One of the, one of the great uh, areas of debate was the person of Christ, and the church came to accept and believe that uh, the scriptural teaching was that Christ 
uh, was God and man inseparably united in a single person. And the oneness doctrine actually makes him out to be two persons. But that's just a basic... Uh, now, let's get to some consequences here. Uh, how serious is it to be a uh, monarchialistic modalism as compared to a Trinitarian? Is this the kind of belief system, this uh, modalistic view of the oneness of God and this distortion you're talking about, is that enough? Uh, to me, it sounds like a perversion of the very nature of God himself. Is that enough to uh, leave that person in, in danger of uh, being lost? Well, I think that the, uh, the denial of the Trinitarian faith, uh, not necessarily the denial of certain terms that we've come to use, but the denial of the concept of the threefold revelation of God, uh, the real distinctions, and uh, the denial of that is, and the continual uh, rejection of the light of Scripture is a very dangerous state to be in, uh, which I'm thankful that I did not continue in that path, and, and I'm sure that there are others who, uh, you know, carefully weigh that and, and have come out of that. But I, I do consider it to be a very dangerous thing because you are approaching the Scriptures and wanting to force them into a mold, whereas I believe that if a person is led of the Spirit of God and truly born of God, they will be led in the opposite direction, and that is to conform my carnal thinking to the truths of God's Word. So without drawing you know, conclusions and judgments, I would say it is a dangerous thing. And well, I would let me ask you this then. Uh... We know the scripture talks about in Galatians 1, 6 through 9 about another gospel. It mentions in, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, about there being another Jesus, another spirit. Uh, now this I, the concept they have of Jesus in, in relation to the Trinity, would you consider this to be another Jesus, perhaps? And does this tie into perhaps another gospel? Well, I would say, well, when you mention another gospel, there are many other aspects of oneness teaching that uh, definitely uh, stray quite a ways from the teaching of the Bible with regard to salvation. So I would again like say... one heresy begets another. Th that is really true. When you, when you deny one thing, it seems like the whole thing unravels. When you, in fact, David Bernard, one of their uh, leading spokesmen or authors, uh, stated that in a tape message I heard him speak to their, uh, some of their ministers. He said, uh, it seems like when you deny one part of it, the whole thing unravels. When you start, and I think personally, I think the reason why that's true is because the same type of thinking and logic process that led them to accept one thing is what they apply to every other area. So when you reevaluate your whole approach to the things of God, I think it starts showing up in how you apply your thinking to all these other areas. But, uh, but I do think, again, I'll say, uh, just generally that it's a very dangerous thing to reject the light of Scripture. And I think that uh, for so many of them that I've known, and I, I won't make a blanket, blanket statement over all, but I think for so many they have a very distorted and twisted view of the gospel and what it means to be a Christian and to be saved. Uh, if I could just take another moment, I, I'll mention a, uh, a young man that I ran into a few weeks ago. In fact, he came into the bookstore and uh, he came in and, and he verbally wanted to talk about his uh, uh, experience and he openly proclaimed himself to be a backslider. He came in and said, yeah, I'm a backslider. I'm not really interested in your material. I just want to look at it while someone's across the street here and uh, until they come by and pick me up. And uh, he was openly speaking about that. He continued on and talked for a good while and I tried to help him as best as I could. He had a very twisted view of Christianity and what it meant. To him, it was just these actions that were part of the faith that he was taught. And he was from the United Pentecostal Church. And I tried my best to talk to him, and he couldn't hardly hear out a, a single sentence. I tried to encourage him, instead of arguing points of doctrine, I tried to encourage him to rest in the work of Christ. Instead of, uh, uh, you know, being frustrated because he couldn't live up to certain standards, I said, why don't you just recognize that as Christians we're called to live a life of faith and rest in the saving work of Jesus Christ, and as an outflow of our true faith, we'll want to serve God, we'll want to live for God. But I, th I said, I think your thinking is all wrong about the Christian life. And, uh, and I couldn't hardly get a single sentence out before he would cut me off and start talking about all these other things. And when he walked out the door, I just had this feeling of, of uh, this, this person's mind has been totally messed up 
from being able to think uh, about the truths of God. He's been so indoctrinated with this way of thinking that he couldn't even consider uh, perhaps something's wrong with his whole basis. And, uh, and I will have to admit that I have known a lot of people that their thinking was really messed up with regard to the teachings of the Bible. And I think it all flows from this way of thinking that we've just been talking about with regard to this one doctrine. Right. Well, we uh, mentioned a, a while ago about uh, historical roots. I had mentioned a moment ago when I was talking about some of the books and things that some groups come along and they, they say, well, this doctrine of Trinity, it's not in the Bible. It, it just came about when a group of men came up with some creed <coughs> at the Council of Nicaea in 325. And uh, Bob, I'd like to get you in on this conversation at last, brother. <laughs> and uh, would you uh, just talk to our viewers for a little while about uh, this whole idea of creeds, what they mean to the Christian faith? Can we find the doctrine of Trinity back to the New Testament, or do we go to the Nicene to depend on this doctrine and, and, and so forth? I know we've answered it pretty much from what uh, Mark has said, but I'd like your, your views on this well, topic. I believe that when we study the scripture and then we study the history of Christianity or the church or whatever you want to call it, the uh, central doctrine of the Christian church is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. In other words, the deity of Christ. Now. I think the doctrine of the deity of Christ is what necessitated the doctrine of the Trinity as a theological statement. Uh, many times we hear people say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The Bible does not say God is a Trinity. This is one of the strong points of those who oppose Trinitarianism. They think it's a strong point, that is. But uh, you see, there are so many things about Christianity that are not just spelled out as formulas or ABCs or uh, drawn in diagrams in the Bible. God left some things for us to put together ourselves, so to speak, in our understanding. You can take a verse of Scripture. You can read it. Mark can read it. I can read it. Another person can read it. Now, what's going on in our minds individually as we read it? We are getting some kind of a comprehension in understanding what it's saying. And if I were to express it, and then Mark were to express it, and you were to express it, and the other person were to express it all separately, not hearing what the other one said, we perhaps everyone would express it in different terminologies uh, as to what we comprehend this to mean, and yet we all might be saying essentially the same thing. So uh, we, we just can't take a scripture or a series of scriptures and just confine our thinking and our uh, reference to these doctrines, to these scriptures the way they were. We have to come to some understanding of them, some comprehension of them. Now, as time went on after the New Testament church was established, this central doctrine that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, he said, I and my Father are one. Uh, John said, uh, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life through his name, John 20 and verse 31. And then uh, Jesus said in John 17:3. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And uh, I think I quoted this one, John 10 uh, and uh, verse 30. I and my Father are one. And the Jews understood this to mean that uh, God was his Father, and he made himself equal with God. And then when Jesus asked Peter, whom do men say that I am? And whom do you say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, all of these scriptures and many more, uh, when uh, the question is put, the question centers in upon what is Jesus Christ? As uh, the eunuch and Philip 
in the 8th chapter of Acts confronted this issue in Isaiah. Philip told the eunuch he could be baptized. On what basis? That he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And the eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So uh, what I'm saying is this, that this doctrine, this central cardinal truth of the gospel, the gospel is this message that God came into the world in the form of a man that was identified as Jesus. This was God in the flesh. Now, as time went on and as men tried to comprehend this, uh, all religions believe in God. I mean, you can go anywhere in the world and you'll find a universal acknowledgement of God. But Christianity is unique in this regard, that God came down and became a man and dwelt in the, the fullness of God in this man and yet was man, the union of God and man. Now, that's where Christianity is so unique. And as time went on, there were various conflicting uh, comprehensions of how these things could be. And then, of course, the denial of it, as we've been talking here about the... Uh, various forms of denial of what's called Trinitarianism. But that's why we have the development of Christian doctrine that comes forth in the creeds. Now, here's another thing that Christianity is often slandered about and misrepresented about, and that is creeds and dogmas and confessions of faith and statements of doctrine. Uh, how often do we hear people say, oh, well, you have a creed book, I have the Bible. You believe what men wrote. I just believe what God wrote, blah, blah, no blah. creed but Christ. Right. Well, the, the point of a creed or a confession or a statement of faith or whatever it may be called, doctrinal expression or whatever, the point is the people at any given time who have set forth these creeds, they're not setting forth a writing that is in competition with the Bible. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to state what they understand and comprehend the Bible teaches. Now, it may be true, it may be false, it may be partly true and partly false or whatever, but it's being honest and above board, stating in a formal way, a collective way, if it's a group of people, what they understand the Bible to teach. They're affirming their faith. Now, everyone does that. I don't care if they call it a creed call it a statement of faith, call it a confession, call it a gospel tract, call it a sermon, call it a Bible lesson, whatever. If they, in any form, take the Bible and affirm a certain understanding of this Bible, they are expressing a creed. They are expressing a dogma. They are expressing a statement of their faith. Now, the creeds that we have in Christianity, the reason that, really the reason that people attack them is because they're wanting to do away with their those creeds and set up their own creed. <laughs> uh, B.H. Carroll pointed out one time about men who attack creeds. Actually, all they're doing is they're trying to discredit that creed so you will accept their creed. And that's not a very honorable way to do it. If you're going to discredit a creed or a dogma or a confession, don't just broad brush it and say, well, this was written by men and uh, I'm just taking the Bible. This is begging the question. If you want to confront a creed, put it out there and say, this creed takes this position as understand their understanding of the Bible was thus and so. I take a different position. I understand the Bible to teach it this way as opposed to the way they understood it. Acknowledge the creed to be what it is, and then you can endeavor to refute it. But just don't dump all creeds off in the corner and say, well, they're written by men, and they're of no value, they're not inspired, as if what I'm giving you by word or by pen is the absolute inspired word of God. Now, we've got a lot of <coughs> jockeys in the world riding that horse, and they're deceiving a lot of people and kicking a lot of dust in people's eyes, and uh, the simpletons that want to go along with that and accept that will. But uh, when we go back into Christianity... Uh, and dig out 
the statements of faith, what's called the creeds, the confessions, the statements or expressions, or uh, symbols, as they're sometimes called. What we find is a history of Trinitarian thought predominant in Christianity. Now, that's why the non-Trinitarians and anti-Trinitarians usually have a distaste in their mouth for the creeds. For instance, as a Baptist, I am a Baptist, and this is the London Confession of Faith, known in America later on as the Philadelphia Confession of Faith, written in 1689. Uh, and it essentially is the Westminster Confession of Faith of the Presbyterians prior to that, with the changes in it that would relate to Baptist ordinances as opposed to the Presbyterian practice and ordinances in the church. But it has one of the, the great historical doctrines or statements on the doctrine of the Trinity in chapter 2 of God and of the Holy Trinity. I'm not going to read all this, but just a line or two. In this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, a one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning. Therefore, but one God. There's your monotheism. We're not believing in what's called tritheism, or three gods. One God, three persons, not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations, as Mark has expounded in the uh, scriptures and the illustrations that he gave, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and our comfortable dependence on Him. Now, in the history, Larry, for the last, uh, what, three or four hundred years, this particular concept in Protestantism, which arose out of the Reformation from uh, European and English Roman Catholicism, this would be more or less the fundamental or accepted statement of the doctrine of the Trinity. I know it would be with the Episcopalian Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist, and generally the Lutherans and uh, the Congregationalists. The major Protestant, non-Catholic Christian groups down through the years have inherited this. Now, when we get into our 20th century, what do we have? Well, we have cultism run wild. I mean, uh, every day there's a new cult being born. And you can almost check them all out by this doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity. They almost, every one, go under and drown on this doctrine if you're going to weigh them. Is this a representation of historic Christianity? Is this a representation of reformational theology? Is this a representation of the great preachers of the past and the great Christian leaders of the past? Put them to the grindstone of the doctrine of the Trinity and generally they will all go up in smoke because this is something that will uh, just consume them because they don't have the firm grasp of the doctrine that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And this is the very heart of our gospel. We're committed to it. Upon this rock I will build my church, Jesus said. And that rock is that he is the Son of God, God in the flesh, the Christ, Lord, and Savior. And that necessitated, as I said, the statement of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now we're running out of time, and I want to throw it back to you so that you can bring our program to a conclusion. Well, uh, we've got just a moment left here, and I'd uh, like each one of you gentlemen to just to give a, like a 20, 30-second brief statement in summation of this first show on our uh, doctrine of the Trinity. Just uh, say something to the viewers concerning it. Define it one more time for the viewers, and uh, we'll sign off immediately after you all uh, give a quick statement. Uh, Bobby, you want to go ahead and go first, and we'll let Mark conclude. Well, I would like to exhort our listeners to commit themselves to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Uh, commit yourself to Him. And if there's any mystery or lack of understanding you have about this doctrine, ask of God for wisdom and then get into his word and study it 
And I firmly believe that your faith will be rewarded and your submission of God will, to, to God will bring results. Mark? The one God of the Bible has revealed himself in the pages of Scripture as being our Father, as being the Son who suffered for us, and as being the Holy Spirit who quickens us and regenerates us and draws us to the cross to see Christ so that we can know God. And this is essential to the Christian faith, without which you are denying something which is essential to its truth and its fullness and its completeness and its uniqueness. The Trinitarian faith is unique to us as Christians. And that's what I would like to leave you with, that Trinitarianism is the Christian faith, and without it, we lose our identity. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I want to thank our viewers for joining us today. Just remember, it was the Father in eternity that chose us. It was the Son in eternity who came and died for us. And it was the Holy Spirit, as you were saying, Mark, that came and regenerated us so we could have our faith in Christ and thus be in union with the Trinity. But uh, we will continue in this series uh, next program. So if uh, you'll tune in next time, please join Bob L. Ross, Mark McNeil, and myself, Larry Wessels, uh, with Pilgrim Publications Presents. Thank you again, and may the Lord bless you. Please contact Christian Answers for free information on numerous subjects, important subjects, such as the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Free newsletters are available on the heretical position held by many unbiblical cults, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and the Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity. Free newsletters are available on strange groups such as the King James Onlyites. To receive your free information, please call 512-218-8022 or email us at cdebater at aol.com. To see full-length videos on these and other subjects, go to Yahoo Video, type Larry Wessels into the search box, and click on the icon for iShoot Video or iShoot Video 2.